Now, next up, we do have our opening keynote of the conference, and it is an amazing conference. It's, in fact, so, you know, we're, we're so privileged to have this keynote speaker that Kylie and, uh, Kylie and I are both going to introduce him. Um, so, you might have seen in the booklet, he is our keynote speaker, the Director General of Security for Australia, also known as the Director General of the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, or ASIO, Mike Burgess. Uh, it really is a, um, a historic moment, I think, uh, to, to give this keynote speech. Uh, back in 2012, in DEF CON, Keith Alexander, the head of the NSA, spoke to a bunch of hackers, and that was a historic moment. But this also is a historic moment uh, for the Director General of ASIO to speak um, to, to us. Uh, this is his first um, public conference address uh, since taking up the appointment and it is just an amazing privilege to have him on the stage, a really an amazing speaker as well. Yep, so we're tag teaming this one because we had a little fight on who was gonna introduce him. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're both doing it. Uh, and it's always a little bit nervous when you're introducing someone you know, of, of such significance as Mike, who, who does make a big difference to the computer security industry in Australia. I wanna say three uh, sort of points about Mike before he comes up on stage. Uh, hopefully I can Remember, I've practiced and I'm so nervous. <laughs> so um, number one, Mike has been a big supporter of B-Sides Canberra and this community for a long time. Um, and this, this, is, this is quite interesting. Um, and people probably don't know this, but uh, uh, each year he buys tickets for himself and his partner and his family. And he, he, maybe he doesn't even know that we realize that. So instead of most you know, senior leadership where they think they should get the free tickets. We're a bit different here where we give our free tickets to the students and we expect our senior leadership to, you know, cough up $100. <laughs> but he has never expected to get a free ride to B-Sides Canberra. In fact, he's been a big supporter of the community. Um, secondly, um, Mike is an engineer. He has a tech background. I'm an engineer, so straight away I'm friends with him because if you've done an engineering degree, that's pretty tough. Um, he has a tech background, he's been a coder, he's been a dev, so he's probably one of the most senior techs I know in, in Australia in terms of the government. Um, I think we did, I think there was some banter of maybe doing some live demos on stage, but I don't think he's going to tempt the demo gods today. But I mean, he, he, he's sort of come from this background, so he understands where we're coming from. And the third point, um, he wants to engage. So he's not going to come up with a bunch of talking points and just um, talk off to you. He wants you guys to ask questions. He's asked um, for about a third of his talk to be questions. So get on Slack, make sure you ask the questions. Sylvia will read them out to him. And this is our opportunity to talk to someone who's very influential for Australia in um, computer security. So, and that's my three points, practiced and delivered. I think I did okay. <laughs> okay, without any more from us, here's Mike Burgess. going to mess up the setup here so just forgive me as I get set up um, thanks guys for that great introduction um, I'd love to see you do a jig or two Sylvia that would be great um, what a fantastic event this is um, and it really is down to many people everyone sitting here everyone listening online uh, the organizers and your sponsors so congratulations this is a fabulous event um, I'm very pleased to be here um, and I'll get back to that in a second but before I do I want to address why the fact I'm using a paper notes to talk to you today. Um, out of respect for this crowd, I'm, people who know me will know I love my tech and I'm attached to my tech and I'd normally have my iPad here and whilst my iPad probably has voided Apple warranty for what we might have done to it, um, I know um, there's a lot of people in this room who'd love to have a crack at that iPad and I'd be pretty confident you'd get on it. So, because I didn't want to be embarrassed, and embarrassed probably because the password chosen, I can't use Face ID, and maybe my password wasn't up to scratch, um, I'm sticking to notes today, and I hope you forgive me. Now, I'm very pleased to be here, but of course, maybe, as the guy said in the introduction, maybe some of you are not so pleased to see the Director General of Security here at a hacker conference. But from my point of view, it makes perfect sense. Uh, why? Because ASIO has expert hackers. We have hackers who hack computers. We have hackers who hack computer networks. We hack phones. We hack buildings. 
and actually we even hack humans always lawfully of course and when we're hacking always with a warrant and equally important we're doing it um, and only for the purpose of protecting Australia and Australians from threats to their security and that's critically important so before I go into the security environment I thought I'd share that with you and I will say at this point I'm also very eager for the questions and your questions can be really hard and you can challenge me and I'm very much up for that if I can't answer the question I'll tell you why I can't answer that question really do want your questions before I do the threat overview though um, and I noticed at the front Silvio said we're not selling to you I'm selling ASIO today to this audience because I want to do a shameless plug for the recruitment campaign we have underway before I get into the threat environment. So I'm looking for people with a passion for technology and security. I'm looking for people who know how to hack. We're looking for people who would be part of our digital and physical access capability. And some of you would really love to see our locks and key room. Also looking for people who could actually take a car apart, move it in through the narrow doors of the ASIO building into our corporate foyer put it back together again, like it had never been taken apart, all for a training exercise. We need people who love to do that. We need people who do that. And we want to have people who actually will do things that everyone else will think is impossible. Now, I know this crowd will think it's possible, but generally most people um, would think what we do is impossible. I think you get the drift. So if you want to make a difference, actually and you're a lateral critical thinker with deep technical skills i think asio might be the place for you because we're looking for you our technical ability and agility go at the heart excuse me i've got to make an adjustment we're good at microphones too in asio <laughs> and i rely on the technical experts for that and i'm a de-skilled engineer these days so that happens to you if you don't use it, you lose it. And I try hard, but I've lost some of it, as you can see. Um, we need people who are technical, because technical agility and, and smarts go to the core of ASIO's operations. We go up against adversaries who are effectively unconstrained by the law, resource, and ethics. We go up against violent extremists who are acutely security aware and tech savvy. And in both those cases, we need to know what they're doing. We need to out-imagine them, out-maneuver them. We need to see what they're plotting and understand what they're doing. Always lawfully, of course. So if you want a license to hack, then I reckon ASIO is the place for you. Our mission is really important at this point in time, and I'll explain that shortly. And the work for our organisation is rewarding. You'd get a chance to make a meaningful difference to Australia's security. My officers do extraordinary things. It's also important to remember they're normal people like every single one of us. At work, they do things that you would think are impossible. Although again, I know I'm talking to an audience that probably has a great imagination and ability in this space. But after work, they're normal people and face the same challenges like we all do. So we are recruiting. Have a look at our technical or technologist graduate program. If you're interested, apply. If you've been at this a lot longer and that's not for you, register your interest online and I can assure you we will respond to you. We're headquartered here in Canberra, but actually we're not just here in Canberra. We live and operate in every state and territory and 12 other countries. So we have a broad remit and we're everywhere. So if you're interested and you don't like Canberra, although I can tell you Canberra is a great place to live, um, please do apply. All right, so we also take diversity seriously we have to represent the people we protect and you'd be surprised by some of our people's backgrounds and i'm a director general with an electronics engineering background so i do take a lot of care and focus on the technical health and the health of my technical capabilities so you'll get good support right from the top down so if you're interested please do apply so let me now turn to our security environment we describe it as complex, challenging, and changing. The terrorism threat remains at probable. Why? Because we have credible intelligence that individuals and groups have the capability and intent to conduct terrorist attacks onshore. And these attacks most likely will be a lone actor or a small group, small cell rather than a recognized group that will use a low capability attack, a knife or a vehicle, not sophisticated weapons. Well, we can't rule out that latter, but that's what we're currently expecting. 
And at ATO, we have the difficult job of determining and distinguishing between talk and action, aspiration and capability. Last year, there were two terrorist attacks in our country and two people died as a result. And there were many disruptions. In March last year in Sydney, an individual was charged with acts in preparation for a terrorist attack. In November, police charged individual with planning to undertake a terrorist attack in the Bundaberg region. And in February this year, in New South Wales, an individual was arrested and charged with acts done in preparation for and planning a terrorist attack. This threat is real. Threat to life is real and will remain ASIO's top priority because it's a threat to life. But let me now switch to threats to our way of life and specifically espionage and foreign interference. And there's an element that's directly relevant to the technical skills in this community. Countering these threats is one of ASIO's most important missions. And in fact, it's where our organisation started 72 years ago. Foreign spies are constantly seeking to penetrate government, defence, academia, research, business, to steal intellectual property, classified information, military capabilities, policies, plans, and sensitive research. They're intimidating members of our diaspora community and they're seeking to interfere in our political institutions. Over the last three years, we've seen attempts at foreign interference at every level of government in this country, local, state, and federal, across every single state and territory. Classic techniques in espionage, such as infiltration, coercion, or the recruitment of sources, are still a feature of the security landscape that we'll look at today. Spice cliches like dead letter drops and writing in code are still actually a thing. And they are used by foreign spies and their proxies and agents in this country. Last year, ASIO's surveillance team spent a day following a spy around a capital city as that spy was looking for dead letter drop sites. I can assure you we took notes and the fact that I'm probably talking about it probably assures you we took action as well. And more often than not though, these classic approaches that we see in the physical world are combined with new technologies. And I know this group knows that. How spies identify, meet and recruit people, their targets has moved online. You're, you know this all too well, and you also know the fact that cyberspace represents a scaled up way of conducting espionage. It's the pace, scale and reach of the problem which makes it significant. And the way I look at it, cyber espionage is still espionage, and that makes it ASIO's business. And it's alive and well in this country. And while cybercrime is the most um, biggest portion of activity seen in Australia, cyber espionage is at levels which are unacceptably high. So what have we done about this, and what are we doing about it? We've used all our human, technical capabilities, our partnerships, our legislative instruments, at our disposal to discover, disrupt and deter threats to Australia, both in the real world and in cyberspace. And we have significantly reduced harm. We've hunted, we've discovered and we have dealt with multiple attempts from multiple countries. It's always important to make that point. The press seem to always want to go to one or two. Multiple attempts from multiple countries to steal Australia's secret and undermine its sovereignty. And last month, ASIO recently uncovered a nest of spies in Australia. Now, I didn't actually say who the spies were or where they came from, because I wanted the focus to be on what they were up to, not who it was. These spies were trying to obtain classified information about Australia's trade relationships. These spies wanted a public servant to give up security protocols at a major Australian airport. They tried to recruit a serving politician and they were monitoring their diaspora community. They successfully cultivated a relationship with an Australian government security clearance holder who had access to the sensitive defence technology. As you'd expect, ASIO acted. We verified and we dealt with the activity we saw that government employee lost their security clearance and we confronted these spies and professionally and privately removed them from this country. 
This will not stop. And this is happening both in the real world and in cyberspace. And if we look forward, ASIO assesses that espionage and foreign interference will supplant terrorism as this nation's principal security concern over the next five years. Now, as I say that, it's important to remember what I said about terrorism. The terrorism threat level remains at probable, and we do not see that reducing anytime soon. And in fact, I've spoken about some of the interesting dynamics we see at play in that space. The threat to life will continue. Espionage and foreign interference will supplant terrorism as this country's principal security concern. The security environment is complex, challenging, and changing. Globally, some nations, a few actually, will continue to develop cyber tools as military capability and for the generation of military effects. And while cybercrime is not ASIO's business, it's not our patch, the criminal gangs will continue on their objectives to make serious money, and as we've seen recently, as they do that, they will have a disruptive effect on our society. Security is now more than important. Countering espionage and sabotage is ASIO's patch. Cyber espionage and sabotage enabled by digital means is very much our business. And while we do not expect to see sabotage actually in the real world, in our country short of conflict, we are anticipating pre-placement of software for potential sabotage when needed. That's where it becomes a problem for us. You know this more than anyone else, but security requires coherent thinking across your people, your places, your technology, and your information. But sadly, many don't. And a deep technical understanding helps. And then, again, that's a nod for this group. This community is critically important. Through your passionate self-drive in this space, you are part of the ecosystem where you're helping this country try and understand what our vulnerabilities are and how we fix them, how we identify and manage these risks effectively. And you're doing that by simply being you, and I congratulate you for that. So why do we need people with deep technical skills and a flair for solving problems? Well, spying is a race to innovate between the spy, spy people spying and the spy catchers. Terrorism is a race to innovate between those wanting to incite and inflict violence on citizens and those trying to prevent it. And at ASIO, we're particularly skillful at innovating in this space as we address these threats. We know our success depends on our ability to fuse new technologies and opportunities and the advantage they bring into our existing tradecraft and skill sets and to imagine new ways of doing things. In our business, there's a conundrum the better we get, the harder it gets. That's okay, for reasons you understand better than most again, but let me explain what it means. If we're successful at doing something, if we're disrupting a spy network or disrupting a terrorist gang, the extremists or the spies, they'll just reverse engineer what we've done and the smart ones can figure out our capabilities. Every time we do our job, it gets harder. And what happens then? These targets bank that knowledge and they change their approach and tack. To detect and defeat our adversaries, we have to do things they think are impossible, and that requires constant focus and evolution. So that applies to whether we're stopping to, stopping to, uh, seeking to stop a low capability terrorist attack or preventing spies from being successful. Spies who are well resourced and unconstrained by law and ethics. Once an adversary knows what we can do, we have to be able to do something else. Now, that's why we don't talk about our capabilities openly. Our capability protection is critically important. But again, I'm speaking to a smart audience who knows what's possible. It's why we need our laws and our technical capabilities, and more broadly, our tradecraft to evolve. There is no set and forget in my business. And that is why ASIO continues to invest in new capabilities and that's why we're recruiting techies, and that's techies in the broad digital and physical access capabilities. We need to keep technology on our side, not on the side of our adversaries. So in wrapping up, the threats this country face are constantly evolving, 
but my organisation is evolving to meet those threats. As a result of our actions over the last 12 months, it's no longer true to say the level of espionage and foreign interference in this country is, is unprecedented. Our actions have made a material difference to our security environment, but as I've said, espionage and foreign interference will supplant terrorism as this country's principal security concern, especially as tensions continue or tensions increase. But it's not a declaration of victory or a mission accomplished. The spies I worry the most about are the spies I can't know about or don't yet know about. We've seen intelligence gathering requirements continue during COVID. No one will be surprised there. We know some foreign governments desperately want to know the secrets of our success. They desperately want to know what's happening in our export industries. And these spies will seek to return with deeper cover, improved tradecraft and better technology at their disposal. In cyberspace, they will keep coming at us. And as we see every day, their tradecraft will continue to evolve and it will improve. And as I noted earlier, the better we do, the harder it gets. This game will continue. We're constantly honing our skills, our approaches, and we're on the lookout for new people. People who can think outside the box. Well, actually, we're looking for people who can get into a box undetected and better still, get into that box whilst it's protected by alarms and cameras. That's the type of people we're looking for. We need people to think what we do is impossible. We do do that. We do the seemingly impossible. And I know that our work makes a meaningful difference. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm really looking forward to your questions or challenges. And I understand it's done online for COVID reasons. So I think, Silvio, you're going to uh, fire away at me on behalf of the crowd. Absolutely. We've got uh, some, some great questions. There have been a continual stream of questions on our Slack uh, channel. And I suppose I'll start off with um, uh, the first one. I'm, I'm just going to go through them sort of sequentially um, and, you know, and, and skip maybe, or not really skip any, but if there's any joke ones, maybe I'll just add a joke here or there. Um, <laughs> please, uh, the first one, and this is by BoxBB, I don't know how to pronounce this, uh, this handle, but they've said this is a spicy one. Um, is it all of ASIO that can't use Biometric Corp or just the upper echelons and senior leadership? And I suppose they've also asked, you know, really for the sort of the, you know, should individuals use um, biometric authentication? Um, you know, is, is that a suitable, uh, appropriate response or, or, is it, or should, should it not be trusted? Can you just repeat the first part? I'm having a bit of trouble hearing with the, the way. Oh, sorry about that. It's just that they've asked, um, uh, is it all of ASIO that can't use biometric authentication or just the upper echelons and the senior leadership? Um, I would say no comment, but I'll give you a better answer than that. Um, there are um, four individuals that are declared in ASIO. Beyond that, I would not comment. Fantastic. Let, um, actually, let me give a bit more. Um, seriously, our, our people, they, they operate in the real world just like you, so they're out there doing the same things that you do and they're subject to the same things you're subject to. We have to live in that world and that's part of our tradecraft. Our officers' identities are protected for very good reasons. It's part of the we have to do things which the adversaries think are impossible. And just a follow-up to that question, should biometric authentication, is it safe for the public to use, I suppose, that they've asked that question as well? I would use it, but of course this group knows in this technology world, um, the scorecard for corporations and governments protecting that information is not where it needs to be and we continue to struggle, but communities like this help find the problems so they can be fixed. And just to be clear, there's a hint in my title, I'm the Director General of Security, not the Director General of Sneaky Spying. We do this for the protection of Australia and Australians and I am very comfortable and in fact I encourage the rising tide of improved security in the people space, technology space, information space because we all need that. Yeah, great. Um, the immediate question after that one uh, is an interesting one, actually, and it says, um, it asks, well, how damaging were the Snowden leaks for the intelligence community in terms of reputation? And what did you have to do to repair that reputation? Yeah, thanks, that's a really good question. Um, well, where you stand on Snowden depends on where you sit. So, okay, I'm the Director General of Security who also spent a long time in the Australian Signals Directorate. Uh, unfortunate 
damaging to capability, real world damaging to capability, which actually does not only hurt nations, including potentially our own, it puts people's lives at risks. Um, I can't say anything kind about Mr Snowden, but he's a free man and he took his actions. And I guess in countries, things like that can happen and people can choose to break the law. In terms of reputation, I think the Australian people are um, quite savvy when it comes to, they know there's intelligence agencies and security agency in this country and they expect us to do their job. And rightly through parliament and through their own public advocacy, they challenge and they question, and that's brilliant. In our democracy, that can happen, but generally, I don't think our reputation was tarnished by that, um, because people expect us to do the job, and there's, history is replete of examples of where intelligence and security intelligence actually does keep people safe. Yeah, fantastic answer. Um, and another interesting question, I think, just immediately after that one as well, this is by uh, Skorov. The last one was by Adam, by the way, on the, on the Slack. This one is by Skorov. And it says, Mike, um, with the increase of ransomware against critical services like hospitals, some people are advocating for active retaliation. I suppose this is the hack back argument, I suppose. Has ASIO done this? And what are your thoughts on the subject? Well, so we don't have a mandate and we're not against crime. We're not an anti-crime agency. We're not law enforcement. We're not like the Australian Signals Director that does have a role in preventing and disrupting electronic attack or cybercrime coming at Australia offshore. Um, so we don't have a role, but I do ha clearly have a view. I'm not a fan of hacking back unilaterally. I don't think that solves the problem. I'm an engineer, I always go to what's the root cause? And we know in the root cause, there's some things that actually generally when a company suffers a ransomware attack and you go back and look at the root cause, that was a known problem with a known fix. And I know it's complicated, I know it's hard, but actually seniors in corporations need to pay attention to their techs and actually do what's needed because that would, doesn't stop at 100%, but it would give you a little bit more resilience. Yeah, fantastic. And a recruitment question actually, I suppose. Uh, what are some tips you would give for someone who wants to get into the intelligence space? And this person has said they're really passionate about human intelligence, social engineering, incident response, and especially our, our leadership uh, down the line. So what would your advice be to them? Uh, well, my tip is continue that passion and just share what you are and why you want to do this and that is the best foot forward. So apply. Um, and if you, you know, we have tech rounds open, you can express your interest online. Our intelligence officers and intelligence analyst rounds are also open. So depending on where you see yourself, give it a crack, put your best foot forward. That's great, that's awesome. Uh, another uh, interesting question now, uh, this is by A. Noble, and he asks, what are the challenges balancing the need to maintain an operational edge, uh, basically keeping exploitable vulnerability secret, and um, balancing that with the need to protect Australians and Australian entities pretty much by applying patches and closing holes? So I suppose it's uh, the protector or, or defender attack sort of argument here. Yeah, no, thank you. That's a great question and a good one to ask. Um, yeah, absolutely. There's a question of equities in terms of do we keep, does my organisation keep something that actually works really well for us in a lawful sense, but actually exposes all of you to compromise and damage by spies or criminals? And we do have a process by which we go through and if there are, um, and we do make decisions about that and we do release stuff in the community to vendors. It's a tricky one. We do need to maintain a capability edge, but if I had something which was bleedingly obvious in terms of a vulnerability, we would get it out there so people could patch it. Yeah, fantastic question to a difficult question, I think. Um, this has 11 likes, 11 smiley faces and four likes and, and three um, very strong likes. Does ASIO or ASD have the better hackers? <laughs> uh, absolutely. The real question would be which one, a ASIO or, or ASD? Yes. But you, no one asked me that question, so it's okay. I don't have to be in that difficult position. <laughs> oh, look, great, great answers so far, Mike, and we'll keep the questions coming. There's, there's quite a few. There's just a stream of questions, so go onto the Slack and keep on asking them. Mike has generously donated his time and, and is being really um, open and engaging here, so we really do appreciate this. Um, is, this question has already been answered, I suppose. What is the greatest threat to Australia's national security and why? I suppose it's already been answered in the 
in, in the threat assessment, but you can add any extra points if you want to that. Um, so espionage, foreign interference, supplants terrorism, but terrorism still remains a problem, so that's significant. The concern is moving forward is the pre-placement of malicious software for potential disruption. And as I said, the criminals are doing a pretty good job at disrupting companies and therefore their customers today. When a nation state chooses to do it, even to send a message, I think we have to draw some air through our teeth and go, crap, because nation states are more resourced and uh, can do more damaging things. That's why security is important. That's why this community is critically important. We need more people like you who know how things work, have a passion for pulling it apart, finding those problems and getting them fixed. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, really nice answers. Uh, another sort of very um, uh, a tough question, I think, again. Uh, there have been a few tough questions here already. Uh, when hacking with a warrant or hacking production resources in the interest of national security without the other party's knowledge, um, how does scoping work? How do you make sure you stay on target and don't access resources that may be unrelated to the job? Yeah, no, that's another great question. So everything we have to do has to be proportionate to the threat we're facing. So when we start out on an investigation, whether it's an extremist or a spy, we start out at lower levels, we start moving up our level of inquiry investigation, we go to lawful means, which can include our special powers, warranted access, and it has to be for the purpose. And we're not on a fishing exercise. When we get a warrant, we're not tapping the whole of Australia to look for who might be the problem. Our starting point starts the lower level with less access and when we learn stuff and we can justify we need a warrant on this computer or this person, we then do it but we have to justify why and it can't just be we're kind of interested. Yeah, that absolutely makes sense. Uh, a question now on cyber physical systems and this person, Cathy Reid, has asked as cyber physical systems proliferate in our homes and in our organisations, um, ASIO can't protect Australia alone, she says. Um, how do you partner with manufacturers and consumers and other agencies? How do you conceptualise security as an ecosystem, I suppose? Sure. So I'd put that in the bucket of the Internet of Things and what's happening in the commercial and the, our home worlds. Um, I'm a great adopter of that stuff, just quietly. So it's an important issue. Um, that's not ASIO's remit per se, in terms of making sure those devices are secure by design and they've got good security. We do need that, that does need to be pressed into. Some companies do it well, other companies are just goddamn awful at it. That needs to lift up. Um, and I know there is some work in that regard. Of course, I will share, as you'd appreciate, if we're trying to get into a box and a box is protected by those devices, it does represent some challenges for us. So I need my people to understand how I can exploit that in a way that allows me to still do my job. But my starting point is, those devices need to be secure because the person asking the question is right. It exposes everyone to those vulnerabilities and whilst it's great tech, we can't have those consequences unintended by criminals or even nation states, but I suspect most of the damage there would come from criminal misuse. And I've got the microphone, so I, and I've got lots of questions, but I do want to ask a question of my own so that I can you know, have this opportunity. And my question, I suppose, is that traditionally intelligence agencies have been very closed, I suppose. And we saw when you were Director General of ASD, um, ASD coming out of the shadows, as I think was the phrase that was being used. I've actually heard this sort of, in a very positive way, referred to as, as the Mike Burgess effect, in fact, uh, the opening of, um, you know, the opening of information. Do you, how do you see ASIO fitting into this? Um, do you see ASIO as, 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 as becoming more open or do you see it, you know, how do you see the, the you know, coming out of the shadows being applied to ASIO? Sure, thank you. Um, the, the reason for me for doing this both in ASD and at ASIO is several reasons. One, um, and I'll speak about the ASIO role, it's simply, I think I do need to, we need to explain the threat to everyone, that's important. I also am a big believer of in our society, people need to understand what ASIO is and why it exists, not the how it does it, because as I've said, I will protect that capability. My people's safety and security and our capability that allows us to do our job is paramount to me. So we'll be open to a point to explain who we are, why we exist and what the threat environment is, which helps lift and counter that threat environment. And as you saw here today, I do it for shameless recruitment purposes because I need people like you. That was the same reason I was doing it in ASD. Bit of transparency, recruitment, but explaining the problem, but actually it's because ASD needs people like you. One more? 
Yeah, fantastic. Th thank you for your time again. It's been such a great honour to have Mike Burgess. One more question. Um, what impact are you seeing from social media on your intelligence ops and on your agents? Oh, that's a great question. Um, impact? No, probably not. I mean, it's just a, it's an information source that can amplify messages. It's used by um, people who have ill intent. Is it uh, damaging to us? No, we are um, successfully navigating this digital world in which we live with some capability challenges. And again, I'll plug, and that's why we need people like you. But generally, no, it doesn't impact us. So thank you, Silvio. Thank you, Kylie. Thank you, everyone. I would say it's my honour to be here. So thank you for having me. And uh, colleagues, uh, everyone here, everyone online, keep up the great work. This is such an impressive community. Look at the size of the people you've had respond to this. It's not driven by corporations, it's driven by you and passionate people who bring you together so you can help each other, learn from each other, challenge each other. I don't think there's another community like this in Australia and it's brilliant, so I'm pl pleasured and honoured to be part of it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.